Uh, today, as we said last week, we will talk about evil, who created it. It's a fascinating topic. So when man observes nature, he sees much pain, sorrow, and death. He sees and he experiences natural disasters and catastrophes that kill people and animals alike with no mercy. He feels the earth shaking under his feet, causing much destruction and death. He sees tsunamis washing people away into the sea, volcanoes erupting and burying towns under ashes. We see diseases and pandemics that decimate whole populations. Diseases caused by viruses, bacteria, and by parasites that take advantage of the ghost. And he asks, who created all that evil out there? Watching the cosmos, men seeing it, seizing it, exploding nobles and black holes that swallow entire solar system every minute. And he asks, why is the universe built like this? Isn't it controlled by a God, bad God or Satan? And when men get sick, very sick, he asks, who is after me? Why do I deserve so much suffering? Where is God? Why doesn't the good God protect me? And when man look, looks at his fellow men, at people who commit heinous crimes and atrocities, men who is cruel and indifferent to other people's life. And he asks, who made mankind so evil? Aren't we controlled by Satan? So the book of Job, as you know, is dedicated to that very old question. Job friends, however, tell him that he must have sinned to deserve his fate. They also tell him that God must have a good plan for him, making him stronger by the, by, by the, with the agony or that God has some other plan, good plan for him. But Job rightly rejects all those explanations. They might appease his friend's mind, but not his own mind. Their words do not confront him, comfort him, the suffering person. To Job, nothing in the world can explain his misery. Then God appears to Job and tells him the bitter truth that mankind can never understand God. Rabbi Soloveitchik, bless his memory, takes this as a lucky guidance. We should never tell a suffering person, he says, that his misery is caused by some kind of heavenly plan or as a test for his character, to enforce his character. We should never engage a, pers a per suffering person with some kind of theology, trying to defend God. Instead, the rabbi says, we should try hard to elevate his spirit, to convert him from a victim to a proactive person whose goal is to alleviate the agony from other people and eradicate evil from the face of the earth. So what then is evil? What does Moses say about it in Genesis chapter one? Who created evil? When and why? Let's note for a minute that our discussion today is a prelude, necessary prelude to the following story of Eden, Garden of Eden, 
in chapter 2 to 5. We can't understand the Garden of Eden without knowing what good and evil are. So let's continue the story of the creation of Adam. So, so far we have learned that Elohim consulted every entity in chapter one and used it to make Adam layer by layer. As the rabbi said, Elohim looked at the Torah and made the world including man. Thus, Elohim consulted the six days and made Adam's body. Elohim consulted his wisdom and science and made Adam's mind. He consulted the spirit of art and made Adam's artistic heart. He consulted his own self and made Adam's self. Moreover, he said last week, Elohim blessed Adam with two powerful drives. The drive to be fruitful and multiply, namely the sex drive, and the drive to rule over, to win power. Those two powerful drives would assure that Adam would not sit idle, but rather aspire to achieve goals and to thrive in our habitat, the earth. All those consultations gave Adam precious, precious gifts, but also opened up the door for idolatry. Since Elohim spoke in plural, in plural voice while created Adam, Adam would be tempted to worship those gifts, worship himself instead of God. Now, Having exhausted almost all the entities mentioned in chapter one, Elohim made his last consultation. <coughs> wishing to plant in Adam even a stronger drive, wishing to ensure that Adam would arrive at the end of the day, six day, our day, Elohim consulted the end of the sixth day where it says, and Elohim saw, everything that he has done, and behold, it was very good, Tomeon. And it was evening, it was morning, the day, sixth day was over. Let me show the slide so you can see where, where, it, where it says. Maybe at the end of the, end of the class, I'll try to upload this, the, the slide. It shows uh, that the, at the end of the sixth day, uh, there is a Sabbath, and YHVH enter on the sixth day, and then it says, Tov Me'od, very good. Elohim, uh, and behold, it was very good. And so here, at the, at the end of, so let's, let's go again. Uh, so Elohim, having exhausted, I said, almost the entire room, uh, entire entities mentioned in chapter one, now it's fine. Elohim made his last consultation, wishing to plant in Adam even a stronger drive, wishing to ensure that Adam would arrive at the end of the day, uh, and arrive at the end of the day to his trial. So Elohim then consulted the end of the day where it says, and Elohim saw everything that he's, he had done, and behold, it was very good, Tov Me'od in Hebrew, and it was evening, it was morning, the sixth day is over. Here the verse says that uh, at the end of the sixth day, Elohim would judge Adam with, a, with the entire six days to see whether Adam has become very good or very bad in Elohim's eyes. If Adam is deemed very, very good, Elohim would allow him and the creation to enter the next day, the Sabbath. But if Adam is deemed very bad, Elohim would terminate him with the entire universe and return everything to nothingness as he has done to <clears throat> numerous other universes before. 
Elohim then consulted the very good option mentioned in the verse and planted in Adam the desire or the drive to do very good things. This would prompt Adam to walk with the right, in the right direction, to be very good in Elohim's eyes. But to balance Adam's drive, to make his trial fair, Elohim also planted in Adam to do the opposite, to do very bad things. Adam, therefore, having a blessed by a free will, would have to choose between those two powerful drives, a drive to do very good things and a drive to do very bad things. Now you may ask, where in the text does the verse mention the option of very bad? It says only very good. The Talmud says it lies in the Hebrew word for very good, tov me'od, because it can easily read as tov mavet, meaning good or death. Thus Elohim consulted good and he consulted Mavet's death. And he made Adam drive accordingly, drives accordingly. Let's note that the Hebrew word term drive, yetzer, refer to a desire to lust, to be attracted and fascinated by the magic of good or the magic of evil. Now, to be very bad in Elohim's eyes, Adam, uh, Adam has to violate Elohim's commandment. Whereas to be, no, let me see. Thus, Adam, Adam, is, a, uh, Adam is attracted now, on one hand, to be very good in Elohim's eyes, to create, to build, to do justice, to comply with the Rokim commandment. But on the other hand, Adam is attracted to do the opposite, to be very, to do very, to be very bad in Rokim eyes, to destroy, to do injustice, to violate all the Rokim commandment. Now let's stay, pay attention to the vocabulary here. If Adam deems very good, he is called righteous in Elohim's eyes, tzaddik in Hebrew. Whereas if he, be, if he become very bad in Elohim's eyes, he violated the commandment, is sinner. But as we know, Adam is judged not only by Elohim, but also by the attribute of mercy, YHVH. You can see that in a text that I wanted to show you. At the end of the sixth day, Adam is judged by Elohim from one side from the sixth day and by YHVH from the other side from the Sabbath. Both attributes judging Adam whether or not he has become very good or very bad. But there is a difference. To be very good in Elohim eyes, Adam needs to comply by, Elohim, by his laws. Whereas to be very good in Hashem eyes, in YHVH eyes, Adam would have to show mercy, compassion, and forgiveness. To be very bad in Elohim eyes, Adam has to violate Elohim commandment. Whereas to be very bad in Hashem eyes, Adam would have to show that he is cruel, merciless, lacking compassion and forgiveness. So each of the attribute has its own <coughs> yardstick to measure Adam. Elohim would measure Adam by the commandment, by abiding by the law. Why to age from the, from the other side, from the Sabbath, will judge Adam by her feature, if, he, if he's cruel, merciless, in compassion, or unforgiving. When Adam is deemed very bad in Elohim eye, in Hashem eyes, let's pay attention to the vocabulary. When Adam is deemed very bad in the Lokim eyes, he is referred to as evil in Hashem eyes. And here we have arrived at the term evil in the eyes of the Torah. It is always associated with Hashem assessment in Hashem eyes, never 
with Elohim eyes. For because the term evil is an emotional reaction to those who act against Hashem's values, the merciful UHVH values. The term evil expresses disgust, repulsiveness, and rejection, referring to a person's character declaring that he is evil. In contrast, the term righteous or sinner in Joachim eyes refer to the balance of person merit and sins on the Joachim scale, rather than to the person character. <clears throat> Let's note now that throughout the entire Torah and the entire Bible, the term evil is always associated with a shame you there by, by a assessment. For instance, when the king of, when the, when the king of Israel are uh, described as evil, it is always said, says, look, evil in Hashem's eyes, indicating that the king has violated idolatry, he worshiped idols like the Canaanites, and also look, took advantage of the poor, and the orphan, and the widows, and the prophet's screen. Now let's ask, does evil prevail in nature? Since nature is so full of agony and sorrow, is nature controlled by evil? That's our first question that we started with. The answer depends on whom you ask. Suppose for a moment you ask this question to a smart spider or a smart serpent that can talk like the serpent in Eden. You ask it, is the world so full of agony and so controlled by evil? <clears throat> the smart spider will not even understand your question. For being made by Elohim alone, the spider will have no knowledge of the merciful YHVH and will not have a clue that the universe could have been created differently with no sorrow and no pain in it. To the spider mind, agony and pains are manifestation of Elohim justice, where animals eat and are eaten, inflict pain and suffer pain. To the spider mind and to the serpent mind, the world seems perfect as it is, with no evil in it. Now imagine that a beautiful cherub, an angel of mercy, wanders into our universe. And you ask that angel, is there evil in the, in the world? The angel would answer carefully with weight his words. He would say, I know that this world of yours could have been created differently with no pain and no agony and no death in it. After all, I'm coming from such a world, from the eternal Sabbath, where Yudem of K reign and Elohim abstain from any ruling. But I also know that the angel will say that the Elohim universe is run by absolute justice. And justice is never evil in Hashem's eyes. The animal who that you see are not evil, the angel will say, since they abide by Elohim orders. They comply with the natural laws and they have no discretion and no free will. But Adam, in contrast, the angel will say, is the only creature here in, a, in your world that may be deemed evil in Hashem's eyes. So man is the only creature that I am aware of you why it's we age and their expectation from us, and can exercise free will to choose between good and evil. No, the angel will say, the world is definitely not controlled by Satan, nor, nor by any independent force of evil. Since the only evil in this world can be done by men who is aware of merciful white we age and yet choose to do the opposite of her wishes. 
So how did Elohim plant in Adam the ability to do evil, to, to do all these evil things? <clears throat> so we go back to Adam creation. When Elohim consulted the six days and made Adam, incorporated all the ability of the creature to cause pain and agonies, he incorporated into Adam's body and mind. Thus, you can say that when Elohim consulted the sixth day, because Elohim consulted it this day, Adam can now blow up things like the exploding nobles on the first day. Adam can wash away and drown people by water made by on the second day. Adam can poison his enemies like vegetation on the first day. Adam can burn and set up fire like the sun on the first fourth day. Adam can swallow like fish, drive and catch his enemy and pray like birds, kill flesh parts like crocodile, all of them made on the fifth day. Adam can pray like beast and bite like snakes made on the sixth day. So while the animals who can do all these things are not are, are considered good in Elohim eyes, when Adam does all these things to his fellow man, is evil in Hashem's eyes. Hence, Adam is the only creature in this universe that carries both the spider and the angel in his heart. And there is a struggle there between. There's a fight. Adam is witness, witnessing the struggle in his heart, the agony, or the, 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 the clash between the spider and the angel in his heart. You can see the universe from the eyes of the angel, and he can act like the spider. So Adam, when he, with his free will, he can now choose to behave like the spider and be evil in the same eyes, or he can act like an angel and become Hashem's beloved one, as Abraham, Abraham, Moses, and David did. Adam can behave like an animal. He can declare that war is good, that only strong, the strong prevail, like, the, like in the jungle, and that God is dead, as Nietzsche said, that the, the Bible is a poison made by the weak to harm the strong and the healthy race. Adam, acting like a spider, can raise an army wearing fancy uniform with a skull emblem placed on his fancy hat and murder millions of innocent people in a calculated, vicious, cool, scientific way like the Nazis did, thereby not only worshiping Satan, but becoming a real Satan on real earth. But Adam can opt for do, to do the opposite. He can let the angel of Hashem enter his heart. He can walk like Noah in Elohim ways and be compassionate and kind and beloved as by Hashem eyes. And since evil is just a, a perception of man from the perspective of, of by Hashem, Evil is a perception of, by, of man from the perspective of Hashem eyes in his heart. The more we accept Hashem in our heart, the more we would be become sensitive to evil doers. But evil, and evil might, and if evil of mankind would grow big, when men become very bad in evil eyes, in Hashem eyes, our illness may block the world's progress to the Sabbath, leaving us in the hand of Elohim to execute his harsh verdict. Here, the slide that I wanted to show you, so the, 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 the verdict very good, very bad, very good, just in front of, in front of the Sabbath. So if, if this become very big, actually block the progress of our universe, to the next day. We sever our connection to Hashem. 
uh, to the Sabbath. In fact, the Torah says in the book of Exodus that the evil of man can grow so much that he would sever the holy name itself, YHVH itself, to two parts, to YH and VH, as if cut again to two, like the Amalekites did at the time of the, of the Exodus. Moses and Joshua, as you remember, fought and won over Amalek. But the Torah says there that this battle is not over yet, and that Hashem would fight for, for many generations to make his name complete again. But as the King David says, King David says in the Psalm song for the Sabbath, that although the evil doers may flourish like grass, they would also burn like dry straw, so that righteous person would bloom like a palm tree in, sitting in God's courtyard. The rabbi asked, who is this righteous person that David referred to? And the answer, this righteous man is Noah. So here, uh, I think that's what I want to tell you today. I, I, uh, if you have any question, uh, you, you uh, can uh, study for me. Uh, in short, I wanted to show you here that uh, if I summarize what I did, first we talk about the, the drives. Yet they are and yet they're so, so tall. The good drive, the drive to do good and the drive to do bad. These are the drives that actually put, uh, <coughs> paint everything we do. The same action can be good or can be evil, depend on your intention and about what you're doing. For instance, I can use science. I can use science for good. I can use science for evil. It depends on my intention, what I will do for it. I can paint uh, for the sake of art, pornography, forgetting about moral, and I can uh, paint uh, for, to, to build a temple or, 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 or create a beautiful vessel for the temple. That's a kind of a metaphor. So every action we do, it can be either good or bad, but there is a passion, we said, drive means a passion to do either good or bad. There is a charm to do evil. There is a magic to do evil, to watch evil, to sit in the arena and watch people being eaten alive by, by lions, or watch movies on the screen, action. <clears throat> there is a passion, a drive to do bad things, and there is a, a same drive to do good things. And I, people have, have to know about it, to be aware of it, and to choose the right, the right passion. And to be aware, you know, to don't know to poison your own soul. And then we said that uh, uh, Adam is destined to be the only creature on, in, on earth that has a spider and the angel in his heart. He can behave, be fascinated by nature, behave like a spider, and it's, it can be very fascinating. You can uh, wear uniforms, and you can uh, feel strong, and, uh, and conquer, and uh, look at the world like a super, super race that want to enslave other races. It's very fascinating and attractive, but it's, it, it is a spider. It is evil in the, in the eyes of Hashem, why? Because you cannot, cannot claim that you don't know Hashem. Hashem is in the heart of every person. How do I know that Hashem is in the heart of every person? That's, what, that's chapter two, the Garden of Eden will tell us about it. No person on earth can claim that he is a spider and doesn't know anything from Hashem. That Hashem, uh, the Bible is a poison. And uh, that war is good. That he is an animal that wants to, to, to be strongly like in the jungle, that God is dead. 
No man can say that and be clean in the, in the heavenly in the heavenly court eyes, and even to us, to human court, because every person has a sense of mercy, compassion in his heart, at least a little bit. Of course, it can should be enforced by training, by study Torah, by walking the right way, but minimum, and every person <coughs> has a sense. Therefore, if a person chooses to be a spider, he is guilty of be choosing evil. All right, any question?